Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench we have a PTS 250. This particular unit is a 250 megahertz or 1 megahertz to 250 megahertz adjustable frequency source and it is synthesized. Uh, PTS uses a mix of digital as well as analog components to synthesize the frequency and we have a adjustable frequency from 1 to 250 megahertz. This one does have the option down at the bottom, so this dial is populated. If you don't have the decimal point option, which would be a 100 millihertz adjustment, um, this knob will be here, but it'll be blank. So this one is optioned up, which is kind of cool to see. Um, this is one of those units that it does one thing, but it does that one thing incredibly well. And this is kind of what sets it apart from a function generator or something like that. The clock in this is much more stable, much better phase noise. Um, it, it does one thing and does one thing exceptionally well. So, and that is generate a adjustable frequency. There's a meter here for dBm into 50 ohms. And I believe, if I remember right, it'll do 0.1 to... Uh, plus th no, it'll 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 do 0.3 to plus 13 dBm into 50 ohm when it's working. So what we're going to do is we'll take the cover off, give it a good visual inspection, and um, see if it needs repair. See if it functions. If it functions, we'll get it in the lab. If it doesn't function, we'll make it function. Okay, this unit does not have the remote control box. There will be a box over here that plugs into the GPIB. We do have a little bit of GPIB, but we don't have the remote control box that on some of these units will pop in right here. Um, no 10 megahertz out option and no main output. So the main output on this one is in the front. There's one main output. You can move it to the back. You can move it to the front. This one's in the front, which is actually where I prefer it for the bench. We do have an internal standard, external standard. Looks like whoever was using it last had it on external. Uh, and it will take a 5 or 10 megahertz clock on the input. And then we also have a 10 megahertz output. So we can get 10 megahertz out from the time base that's in here. But looks like uh, this is some power supply stuff under here, transformer and a couple of pass elements uh, shielded. So fingers can't find the collector voltage. Let's see what we have inside. I'm expecting this to be relatively simple. The heart of this unit's obviously going to be the uh, ovenized crystal that's going to be the main internal time base. If this thing does work, we will uh, I'll strap it to the rubidium in the lab just so it's with all the rest of the equipment. <clears throat> Are you going to come out? Or do you need some persuasion? It should just slide. Uh, no, there's more screws. Haha, -ha, that's why it won't come out. Whoa, that is way more shielded than I expected. Uh, it looks like we even have a uh, some kind of adjustable cavity here. Let's see what it'll stand up. I do not know what these, these are the um, decades. Okay, that makes sense. Power supply stuff, nothing, actually nothing too exotic. Two set points on the power supply and some bulk filter caps. We'll check those for ESR, make sure they're okay. They don't look bad. That looks a little strange, but I don't know if anybody's but the lines are right, so it could be okay. Here's our oven. So this is going to be our crystal oscillator. The, there's an adjustment for those that haven't seen inside these ultra-stable ovens before. There's a adjustment capacitor right underneath this screw that if you have to set the uh, time-based frequency, that is relatively easy to do. Actually, probably the easy way to set that would be hook it up to the 10 megahertz output 
and then just frequency counter it to as close to 10 megahertz as possible. Let's crack, let's pull the top off of one of these. Kind of take a look and see what's in there. I am curious, but I do not want to disturb this too much because this is a very precise. I mean, if you're if you've got 250 megahertz and you're adjusting 0.1 hertz on 250, that is a very, very minuscule adjustment in terms of. Just want to pop the cover off. Okay, so I noticed there were some screws on the top side that were holding in those blocks, and I decided it was going to be a better idea not to disturb those if I didn't, if I could help it. And looking at the bottom of the unit, that is a good choice. So we have our meter, and that is the, yeah, that's the potentiometer. We have our power, main power switch. This is the output, I believe. So we have hard line that goes up, comes out of the decades. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? This is 10 megahertz in and out. Crystal goes up to the switch. So when you have a 10 megahertz in, 10 megahertz out, or the uh, crystal's gonna be out of circuit. It's just gonna be humming along. Lots of hard line. Um, so some pretty neat RF techniques to get this thing going. This is kind of interesting. We have hard line that's soldered to the pad that runs up here, goes to this pad, and then it's essentially this pin and this pin with a coax transmission line, and they do that on every, every block. So definitely wanting to keep, I'm assuming they're wanting to keep the uh, trace impedance but they did it with a actual rigid coax as opposed to like a PCB trace or something like that. So that's just the way it's done. Implemented in this unit, um, mainly analog. So the way this is built, this is mainly analog. We got some, some digital stuff up here, but this is gonna be a resonant filter most likely. Um, and then everything from here down is gonna be analog. So pretty neat design. I'm not seeing anything that's too out of place or anything like that, so I'm going to put the covers back on. Let's give it some power and see if it comes to life. All right, I'm about ready to test this thing out. We're going to ask it for 10 megahertz exactly. I have the attenuator off, so it should give us full power out. We have a 50-ohm terminator going into the 7603. And the 7603 is pumped up to this frequency counter, so we'll be able to see the frequency. I have the 5345 looking at the crystal output. And one of the things that's nice is when this is off, it's truly off. I have zero current draw, so it's not heating up the crystal, things like that. So this will need some stabilization time before it reaches its specification. But it's not like some of the HP gear that when it's plugged in, the crystal stays warm and everything like that. So we'll go ahead and turn it on. And I have deflection on the meter. Looks like we have a trace. And I have 10 megahertz. We're off by about 162 hertz on 10 megahertz, which isn't awful. And we can probably adjust this. Oh yeah, that's looking real nice. Okay, so the unit does work. Um, here's what the, uh, time base is doing. Taking a look at the, uh, 5345, our time base is running a little fast, which means all our counts are going to be a touch fast. So that's probably going to have to be adjusted, but that's not uncommon with a unit that is going to be this old. This sine wave at 10 megahertz looks very good. Um, that is a significant, uh, not much distortion there. Nice and symmetrical. Shape-wise, it's great. This is about as fast. I can zoom out. This is about as fast as the uh, 7603 is going to run. I've really been running into um, 
limitations from the 7603 because that's only a 100 megahertz scope. And I keep doing things above 100 megahertz. So we're going to have to get the 7854 online in short order. But this is working great. I'm going to leave this on, let this power cycle, keep monitoring it. Everything's going good. And we will see what happens. When the unit's in operation, it's drawing about 50-ish watts, which isn't terrible. It's off angle, but that is what my power meter's telling me. 120, lab's running about 124 volts at the moment, so a little bit low given the heat load that's outside. We can see as the crystal warms up, it's coming down. So it's getting closer and closer to 10 megahertz, which is good, which is what we'd expect. Because the gate time on the other counter is run a little quicker. We can actually see it counting down as that crystal comes into specification. That's not too bad. So we're off by one hertz, 1 1.5 hertz on 10 megahertz. That's not terrible for not being adjusted. And our time base is off by 15 hertz. That's not terrible for not being adjusted either. So I, I can't argue with that. Also, from a stability standpoint, it's dithering about 5 millihertz plus minus a little bit. Like right now, it's kind of bouncing around 1. So... And the other thing, the the other thing that's really impressive about this is, this is free running. It's not locked. It's stabilized to the GPS. It's not hooked up to the rubidium. Nothing. This is free running. So, the time base in this thing is is amazing. All right. Well, it deserves a cleaning. So I'm gonna get to cleaning up the front of this thing. Pull all the stickers off. Get everything all done up, and then we'll tweak the time base. But that's really all this thing needs. Well, that cleaned up exceptionally well. I was not expecting the uh, front face to come that clean, but that one, well, the proof is on the camera. So I am happy with that. Let's crack the uh, unit open and tweak this time base. All right, I have the time base piped into the best counter we have in the lab. Now this one, the time base is on my rubidium lab source. So this is the most accurate counter we have here in the lab, which does prove that the internal reference on my 5345 needs to be tweaked as well, because it was saying it was, well, it was saying 15 megahertz. Um, no, it was saying 1.5 megahertz on 10 megahertz, and this is 4.3. So really not that bad, uh, but this agrees exactly with my 53131A. So we're going to go with that. We're going to see if we can tweak this a little closer to 10 megahertz. The adjustment we're doing is just through this hole. There's a flathead tuning capacitor in here, and I'm using a non-inductive ceramic and plastic screwdriver to do this adjustment so we don't get any induction effects from the tool actually tuning. All right. You guys tell me when I hit 10 megahertz. Extremely touchy measurement or er, adjustment. Too far? Just breathing on this control is causing the clock to jump. Oh. Just the weight of the tuning tool is putting it up about 32 millihertz. I want to come down just a touch, right about there. 
All right, so our clock is off by 24 millihertz on 10 megahertz. Not bad. <laughs> I believe that'd be about 26 ppm if I do the math right. So here's our 10 megahertz. And if I move down to the other frequency counter, here is our 100 megahertz. I adjusted the knobs in the front. And as you can see, we have the same oscillator shift, except we're now shifted up by an order of magnitude, which is expected because we have shifted up the frequency by an order of magnitude. If I dial it back, that'll drop accordingly. So I am not unhappy with that as a local oscillator. Uh, I am going to throw this on the rubidium, so it will tighten it up quite a bit. But uh, for being local, that is not bad. Just for fun, we'll kick it over to the rubidium. I'm going to hook this into the five mega, one of the 5 megahertz ports right now. We got signal back, and there we go, 100 megahertz, solid. So, extremely happy with that. Not going to worry about it too much. It's one of the reasons why I want to distribute the central clock to all the RF gear in the lab is so I don't have these little inconsistencies in the clocks stacking on top of each other, causing measurements to go a little funny. I'll base every, everything that I can based on a 10 megahertz standard, it, uh, I want to hook up to the 10 megahertz standard. We uh, are going to be doing some things on the rack or on the shelving that's over to my left where there's a lot of gear on here that has 10 megahertz inputs that needs 10 megahertz uh, to be distributed. So we're going to take a look at getting that where it needs to go and um, taking care of things. That is one of the problems with unstable clocks, jittery clocks, things like that. As you take frequencies and you scale them up, the error multiplies. So if you 100x the, or if you 10x the frequency, the error 10x as well. If you 100x the frequency, the error 100x's as well. So this is why some of these clocks, uh, the stability and the accuracy of some of these time bases is so, so critical to the lab. Thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at this PTS 250. If you're liking the content, hit the subscribe button, the notifications, and the bells, and do all the YouTube things so you'll be notified when I release future videos. If you'd like additional content in a hurry, check out the Patreon page. Patreon's running a little bit ahead on videos from YouTube. As of right now, there is nothing behind the paywall, the recording of this video, but the support from the patrons helps make the channel possible. So if you'd like to support the channel, help me get more videos up on YouTube, Take a look at uh, the Patreon page, see what's out there, and hang around. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, hit me up in the description. Description. Comment section. I read all the comments on all the videos, and I love talking with everybody in between video releases. With that, as always, more is on the way, and I will see everybody in the next video.